today's lecture is uh, about uh, Australia at the outbreak of the First World War. It's really setting the scene, I think, for the program of events that will follow. We're really looking at what did Australia look like in the lead up to the war? What did Parliament look like? Professor Joan Beaumont uh, probably needs little introduction, but I will anyway. Uh, Joan is an internationally recognised historian of Australia in the two world wars, Australian defence and foreign policy, the history of prisoners of war, and the memory and heritage of war. Joan is currently professor at the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the, at the ANU's College of Asia and Pacific. Her many publications include Broken Nation, Australians at the Great War and the Great War, and Comrades in Arms, British Aid to Russia, 1941 to 45, and uh, of particular interest to us, I think, uh, here in the Library Research Service, the, uh, uh, her role as general editor of volume six of the definitive reference volume in the Australian Centenary History of Defence, uh, Australian Defence Sources and Statistics. I'm uh, currently reading as my homework, uh, Broken Nation, and uh, thoroughly enjoying it, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, today's speech. Please join me in welcoming uh, Joan Beaumont. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's a great pleasure to be here. Can you all hear me at the back? It's good. I have, I should say, in opening, taken the liberty of going a little beyond 1914 because when I started looking at this topic in more detail, I realised that it's impossible to stop the story in December 1914. But my focus is, I hope, satisfactorily on the Australian Parliament. Now, the past has been called a foreign country. And one of the challenges of imagination that I think we face as we commemorate the centenary of World War I is that the war as we choose to remember it is not the war that Australians experienced. And we struggle to understand their experience and their values. Uh, today's Western democracies that are materialistic, individualistic, postmodern and intolerant of mass casualties have such radically different value systems and social mores that we struggle to understand the stoicism and patriotism that meant that Australians a century ago accepted casualties on an almost unimaginable scale. Now today I'll be exploring the foreignness of the past by looking at the landscape of the political party system and the federal parliament that governed Australia during this war. In particular, what role did they play in the national response to the crisis and how was Parliament and the political party system changed by the war? Well, let me start by sketching the political scene of 1914. The Federation of Australia, of course, had been formed only a few years earlier in 1901. And at that time, the balance between the Commonwealth and state parliaments was strongly in favour of the states. The political party system itself was also in its infancy. In the first decade after Federation, there'd been a series of short-lived coalitions federally between political groupings, none of which could govern in their own right. On the conservative side of politics, there was a major fault line, um, and this had been inherited from the colonial period, along the question of free trade versus protectionism. But as the power of the Australian Labor, started, the Labor Party started to grow nationally, the non-Labour forces responded by forming what was called a fusion, the Liberal Party, in 1909. The ALP had emerged from the trade union movement in response to the very serious economic depression in the 1890s and a series of bitter strikes and lockouts, which in many ways the union movement had lost. Trade union movementship in 1914 was high, about a half a million. A population at this time, 1911 census, was 4.3 million. And this powerful industrial movement dominated the ALP at the local branch level and throughout the parliamentary systems. In federal parliament, Labor had managed to form minority or majority governments three times before 1914 and at the time of the war was in power in three of the six states, New South Wales, Tasmania and Western Australia. It's important to the story of the war, however, to realise that success electorally had created quite serious tensions between the political and industrial branches of the Labour movement. Essentially, the question was whether Labour, once it had gained political power, 
should use this to improve worker conditions by, quote, civilising capitalism, or rather by trying to destroy it. Should the union movement rely on the arbitration system, which had been created in the first decade after federation, or should it pursue change through direct action? Syndicalist and anarchist theories were very popular at this time. I mention these debates because that tension in the labour movement would explode during World War I. 1914 began with the Liberals in power federally, but only by the slimmest of majorities, 38 seats in the representatives as opposed to 37 Labour. In the Senate, where there were six seats per state at this time, uh, the position of the governing uh, party was far worse. I remind you that the Parliament was meeting in Melbourne, not Canberra, and I found it was interesting that one of the first decisions of the Parliament after the war declared was to defer the designing of Parliament House. Now, this uh, slim majority frustrated uh, the then Prime Minister, Joseph Cook. Oh, I should mention this is indicative of the tensions of the, within the industrial and labour movements, uh, political labour movements at this time. This is a cartoon from very early in the war which depicts it as very much a struggle between labour on the right and the bloated plutocrat representing uh, uh, capitalism on the left. So I'll go on to these photographs first. On our right we have Joseph Cook, the Liberal uh, Prime Minister, and on the left a very important figure in the history of World War I, the Governor-General, Sir Roland Munro Ferguson. Um, Munro Ferguson, it should be noted, was a man who took his vice-regal responsibilities, which were quite extensive, very seriously. He was a Scottish peer and a former British politician, and he was at that time the channel through which all communication between the Australian government was funnelled, uh, sent through to London, a point I'll come back to later. Now, just before war broke out, Cook had persuaded Munro Ferguson that uh, he should have a double dissolution. So the Federal Parliament was actually prorogued for the election late in July 1914. This meant that it was not in session when the crisis that followed the assassination of the Prince Charles, as I call him, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, uh, developed. The Austro-Hungarian government uh, gave its ultimatum to Serbia on the 23rd of July, by which time essentially the politicians were heading for their electorates. And Parliament was not in session when Britain in turn declared war on Germany on the 4th of August. Now this actually doesn't, probably doesn't make much difference. For one thing, the decision to take Australia into World War I was made in London, not in Melbourne. The Constitution of 1901 had given the federal government a rather ambiguous power called, quote, external affairs. But it was not really clear what this meant. And in practice, Australia, like the other dominions, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa, and Newfoundland at that time, accepted that the right to conduct foreign policy remained with the British government that could speak on behalf of the whole empire. I should stress that this did not mean that Australians thought their interests in foreign policy were always identical to those of Britain. Indeed, the fact that Britain had formed an alliance with Japan, the growing regional power in 1902, was a source of real unease to Australians. And the Dominion leaders had extracted from the imperial government at a conference in 1911 a promise that it would consult with the Dominions in the making of imperial foreign policy. But in fact, the British government did not consult the Dominions during what's called the July crisis of 1914, or about its decision to go to war. But again, this did not really matter um, because even before Britain had declared war on behalf of the whole empire, Munro Ferguson had prompted Cook to call the cabinet together to discuss what Australia's response to the imminent war would be. Now the cabinet at this time was small. There were only 10 members and most of them were out on the election trail. There was no air travel, I remind you at this stage. The roads were poor and uh, there was not even a transcontinental railway between uh, the East and the West. So when the Cabinet met to discuss the crisis, there were only half of the Cabinet present. Five politicians, 
who acted on the advice of senior military and naval figures. And it was these five that made the momentous decisions that would shape Australia's role in World War I and, I think, shape Australian history. The five were Cook, his Attorney General William Irvine the Minister and the Minister for Defence, one Senator Millen, the Vice President of the Executive Council and an honorary minister, so-called. Four of the five, I can't find information about the honorary minister, had been born in the British Isles. You'll note that two of what we would think were the key portfolios were not at the Cabinet meeting, the Minister for External, or as we now call it Foreign Affairs, and the Treasurer, who was Forrest, one of the grand old men of Australian politics of the time, and he was campaigning in Western Australia and couldn't get back. So this small cabinet decided firstly to put the relatively new Royal Australian Navy, only created three years before, under the control of the Royal Navy, the British Navy. Now this was no surprise since all pre-war planning had assumed that the forces would be integrated in time of war. But far more important was the decision of the cabinet to raise a force of 20,000 volunteers of infantrymen which Britain could deploy as it wished. And moreover, the federal government committed itself to pay the costs of the maintenance of this force. And with this decision, what was to become known as the Australian Imperial Force started. It would grow to 15 times the original commitment, around 330,000 men. Now, Cook and his cabinet were confident when they made these decisions that they would get the support of parliament. Because the leader of the opposition on the left, Andrew Fisher, had already committed himself unreservedly during the election campaign to the imperial cause. It was Fisher who uttered what is perhaps the most famous of all declarations of the time, that Australians will stand beside our own to help and defend her to our last man and last shilling. A phrase that tended to haunt, I think, him particularly over the years. Fisher's senior colleague on the right, WM, always known as Billy Hughes, was even more passionately an imperial loyalist, though a member of the Labour Party. During the election campaign, Hughes actually proposed that in the interests of national unity, the election should be declared off, a bit like some football game. And his idea was that, by, um, the, that the proclamation dissolving parliament could either be revoked or in order to ensure continuity of government, each party should agree not to put an opposing candidate against sitting members. I think that would be quite popular today, wouldn't it? <laughs> but at the time, it was seen as a maverick idea and no one, including Fisher, took it seriously. So the election proceeded and resulted in a victory on the 5th of September 1914 for the ALP. 42 seats to the Liberals, 32. In the Senate, it was a wipeout, 31 Labor to 5 Liberals. Fisher became Prime Minister and Hughes Attorney General. Fisher, it turned out, for all his impressive pre-war credentials in defence, did not find being a war leader but at all to his taste, and he would resign in October 1915 to become High Commissioner in London and, tragically later, quite soon, succumbed to dementia. So Hughes becomes Prime Minister in October 1915 and is, in my opinion, uh, uh, an almost force of nature, extraordinarily influential figure in Australian history. As they had anticipated, when the new parliament met in early October 1914, and by this time, it was quite clear that all the plans of the military commanders in Europe were completely in tatters. Um, the Marne is, is at least three weeks earlier. There was bipartisan support for the war effort. But I should mention, as that slide I've already shown you um, indicates, I will turn to it, there was ominously some opposition in the labour movement. Uh, they saw this as a war between labour and capital in which the only people who would benefit would be these fat plutocrats. Here's another wonderful slide from the Australian worker which has the soldier, sorry, I always do that, the soldier, of course, looking out towards the battlefield, the, the, the bloated plutocrat stealing the food from his family. This position was not simply based in ideology. 
The war very rapidly di uh, disrupted the Australian co economy, which was very dependent on international trade. And soon there were high levels of unemployment and price inflation, which eroded the real value of wages. And the issue of, of the price of essential commodities was a running sore throughout Australian political life in the war. Now, the Governor-General's speech for the new Parliament meeting in October 1914 listed an agenda which included, not surprisingly, a carryover of some of the pre-war labour policies for social welfare and national development, things such as the unification of railway gauges, increases in old age and invalid pensions, and um, the transcontinental railway. But these were soon swept away on the tide of war, and uh, you will see that the emphasis of the parliament as the years progressed was naturally and inevitably on war-related issues. Now the first amongst these was the issue of how to fund Australia's military commitment. And obviously the costs of this soon span, uh, spun rapidly uh, out of control. Uh, it's hard to get a sense of real value now, but the total cost of the war, including reparation and pensions, was estimated in 1934 to be 831 million pounds. The Fisher government originally hoped that they could keep their social welfare program going and would fund the war through revenue. And in its first budget, it increased land tax and introduced federal inheritance duties and, cust and, and um, amended customs tariffs. But within the first year of the war, expenditure was almost 25% higher than projected revenue. And as you no doubt know, the federal government had limited taxation powers, particularly over income tax at this time. And so the parliament had to turn to two other main sources of revenue. The first was loans raised from both the British government and the London money market. And I actually find this an interesting issue, though it sounds quite dry. The problem was that the British government was willing to assist the Australian government in financing its war expenditure but only its war expenditure. It was far less keen about uh, providing loans for capital works. It asked quite reasonably, how could the Commonwealth government expect to raise the army it had promised if at the same time it was spending millions on public works, which, quote, will give profitable employment to thousands of men who ought to enlist? This was, let me say, an issue not just at the federal level, but particularly at the state level. The federal government wanted to fund this or complete this transcontinental railway, in part, for, let me say, for defence purposes, which it had begun in 1912. And the state governments were keen international borrowers of capital and, of course, relied on capital works for their electoral popularity and for local economic development. This was, in some ways, a time of big government. The conundrum about war loans from the British was partially resolved when, in March 1915, the British agreed to allow the Dominions to borrow in the open market such sums as were needed to complete capital works already under construction, but not to start new ones. And the federal government managed in late 1915 to persuade the state governments, with the exception of New South Wales, to allow all overseas public borrowing to be ch channelled through the Commonwealth Government. But this was not enough, and another source of funding had to be found, which was loans from the public. So in July 1915, the Parliament approved the first of what, to be, what were to be seven war loans. And here is the kind of public effort that went into raising war loans from the Australian public. This is in Martin Place with a mock destroyer uh, to encourage people to lend their money to the government. Ultimately, over £250 million was raised by this means, and to give you an indication of, of the popular support, the seventh loan, it's estimated, uh, was, was funded by one in every four households of Australia. In 1917, also another £7 million plus was raised from war savings certificates. And I think one of the things we forget is that the, the very extensive level of I might call it low level of patriotic support in Australian society, of which this is evidence. Moving on from money, the second major item on the parliamentary agenda was internal security. That is, how to ensure that the home front and the war effort there was not undermined by subversion and dissent. Uh, 
or what popularly was called at the time the enemy within. Hence the name of that cartoon, which I might come back to. So very quickly, by the end of October 1914, the government rushed through what would become known as the infamous War Precautions Act. Now this legislation gave the executive branch of government the power to govern by decree through regulations quote, for securing the public safety and defence of the Commonwealth. The passage of emergency powers in itself is not especially remarkable in times of major wars. But what this did was to give the executive branch of government extraordinary discretionary powers and, as it turned out, quite arbitrary powers. And when Hughes became Prime Minister in 1915, he would exploit the War Precautions Act not just for the purposes of waging the war, but quite clearly for his own domestic political advantage. The Act was amended several times and its regulations were constantly increased by um, executive action approved by the Governor-General until there were more than 100 regulations imposing all kinds of restrictions on freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and so on. Once when uh, Robert, Ga Robert Garron, who would become Solicitor General during the war, was approached with the question by one person as to would it be an offence under the War Precautions Act, uh, Garron just cut him off with yes before he even found out what, what the projected offence was. Now, one of the purposes of the War Precautions Act was to control what were called enemy aliens, that is, Australians of German or Austrian or later um, Ottoman birth. In the census of 1911, it was estimated that there were about 32,000 residents who had been born in Germany and more than two, or close to 3,000 actually, born in Austria-Hungary. And there were another 74,000 Lutherans, which you could probably have guessed would have been German. And it seemed reasonable to assume that at least some of these residents might pose security risks in the sense that they would have conflicting loyalties in time of war. So as soon as war broke out, uh, anyone who was deemed to be an enemy alien was forced to register with the police. German clubs and consulates were threatened by storming crowds in the capital cities. And progressively, these unfortunate individuals were forced out of employment, their businesses were shunned, and the government began, using the War Precautions Act, a process of widespread internment. Initially, it was only those people who had been born overseas who were the subject of internment and harassment, but by 1916, even people who had been, quote, naturalised as, as Australians and British subjects were caught up in this net, as were, were people who were born in Australia but who had fathers or grandfathers who had been born in an enemy country. Ultimately, some 6,890 Australians were interned and the processes are recognised to have been arbitrary and rather capricious because local authorities were able to interpret the regulations of the War Precautions Act as they saw fit. You might ask, given the abuse of the War Precautions Act, why it was passed so, through Parliament so easily in October 1914. Some parliamentarians were in fact a little nervous about its potential to introduce martial, something like martial law. And indeed the Member of Parliament from the uh, electorate of Angus in South Australia in the Barossa Valley, which of course had a significant German population, did raise the question of um, the problem of naturalised Australians being deemed aliens. But most of the reservations about the War Precautions Act just simply dissipated in the pervasive sense of crisis that prevailed at that time. Irvine, um, who had been Attorney General, said, well, in times of war, governments do many things that are not authorised by law. And Hughes gave the assurance that the gov government would use the new powers given to it as sparingly as possible. Now, alas, this is the work a bit later, Hughes's promises came to be revealed as like a pie crust made to be broken. And he, of course, did not uh, use the power sparingly. And I think it is salutary to, to note with how, how easily fundamental civil rights were surrendered uh, in time of war. A third concern of the Parliament was with eliminating, not just controlling, but eliminating trade with enemy countries. 
As soon as the war began, the British government began imposing and using its historic weapon of blockade, listing many goods as contraband and therefore unable to be sold to enemy countries. And in October 1940, the federal parliament followed with the Trading with the Enemy Act, which prohibited trading with companies controlled by enemy nationals. And from this base, Hughes, who became obsessed, I think that's an appropriate word, with eliminating any trade with Germany, not just during the war but after, he had this vision of a very autarkic British imperial economic system, and he moved to gain control of any German firm which, um, in Australia, but particularly those which dominated the important base metals industry. That's lead, zinc and copper. He saw these firms, as he called it, a great German octopus with tentacles that gripped the Australian metals trade. So later in 1915, the Parliament passed the Enemy Contracts Annulment Act, which allowed all contracts with enemy companies to be cancelled. What constituted an enemy contract was a matter for the Attorney General, who happened to be Hughes at the time, to determine. And then in face of considerable industry opposition, Hughes established a bit later in the war an Australian metal exchange which established Commonwealth control over the treatment and sale of Australian metals. And gradually, a more refining of metals was introduced in Australia. There were local beneficiaries of this. Uh, in April 1915, BHP, for example, opened its steel works at Newcastle, and a zinc refinery was established a little later in Tasmania. So in that sense, the war was not all lost for Australia. But the story was very different in human terms. Even before the Australian forces were deployed at Gallipoli, it was clear that there would be mass deaths and injuries and that many families would be left without a breadwinner. The first wounded arrived home shortly after the Gallipoli landing in July 1915. Amongst them were quite a few um, sufferers of venereal disease who were quickly hurried away. Um, and in anticipation of the needs of soldiers and their families, Parliament passed a War Pensions Act as early as November 1914. Thereafter, more and more resources were poured into what became known colloquially as repatriation or the repat. Support for pensions was naturally bipartisan, and in July 1915, a federal parliamentary war committee was established with members from across the political parties. There was a growing demand by some people that there be a national parliament, a national government, such as it had been introduced in Britain, but Australia never went for a coalition government. It continued to have elections, as we'll see. The primary role of this parliamentary war committee and the network of war councils that established throughout the states was to co coordinate recruitment efforts, but it was also assigned the role of integrating government initiatives at all levels to provide employment, medical care and ultimately land settlement schemes for returning soldiers. I think what needs to be stressed is that for Australian authorities at the time, repatriation benefits and recruitment were the two sides of the one coin. It was assumed that you could not persuade men to volunteer if they feared that their families, or themselves if they were injured, would be left destitute by their service. And recruitment by mid-1915, and this is evident in the establishment of this committee, was becoming the dominant issue in Australian politics. Men had flocked to enlist in the first months of the war, and the original promise of 20,000 volunteers was met within a matter of weeks. And by the end of 1914, over 40, uh, sorry, 50,000 men had enlisted. Recruitment continued at reasonable rates in early 1915 and then surged in the middle of 1915, partly in response to the news of Gallipoli and partly because the federal government, uh, there was a real sea change after Gallipoli and the federal and state governments started to launch much more systematic recruitment campaigns. But the gap between enlistment and battle, battle casualties continued to grow. This is for the whole war and uh, this is enlistment and these are the battle casualties. The gap continued to grow in late 1915, and from then on, it never really, enlistments never kept pace with the losses at the battlefront. And this gap triggered what 
I'm sure you've all heard of the conscription campaigns, which must rank as the most divisive debate in Australian political history. This was, as we'll see, conscription for overseas service. The debate actually began much earlier than the, the famous referenda, because as soon as the Gallipoli landing showed the scale of the likely losses, the conservative forces started to lobby for conscription. They saw it as necessary not just to replace the military casualties, but because, in their mind, all citizens had a duty to serve in defence of the nation and the empire. Now, Fisher was very ambivalent about conscription, but Hughes was a different matter. His political base was the trade union movement, and he had no problems with compulsion in the form of the closed shop in the union movement, so why would you not have compulsion for the defence of the nation? But the labour movement from which he came was profoundly divided on the issue, and so legislation approving conscription was very unlikely to pass, even though labour had a majority in both houses. I need to explain that legislation was necessary because the Defence, Defence Act of 1903 had created only a small regular Australian army, and this could not be deployed overseas. A compulsory military service scheme had been created in 1911 with Labor's support, but this was for home defence only. So the AIF from the start and throughout the war was of a force of volunteers. When Hughes became Attorney General, he started to grapple with this problem and he passed an act called the War Census Act. Which, and what happened in this census was that all males between the age of 18 and 60 years were required to complete questionnaires about their age, their occupation, how much military training they'd had, and the state of their health. To satisfy the demand on the left that you also had to have a, what was called a conscription of wealth, they also asked people about their personal wealth, their assets, their property and their income. Now, Hughes assured everybody that the war census was not a forerunner to conscription. But those who thought they smelt foul play had, were hardly reassured by four questions in the war census, which people were required to answer. Questions were, are you willing to enlist now? Reply yes or no. If you reply yes, you will be given a fortnight's notice before being called up. <laughs> If not willing to enlist now, are you willing to enlist at a later date? Reply yes or no, and if willing, state when. If you are not willing to, to enlist, state the reason why as explicitly as possible. Well, despite this, the issue of conscription was kept just under control while Hughes was away from Australia lobbying in London for the first half of 1916. It's amazing he was away really from about January to the beginning of August an absence of a Prime Minister, which I think is impossible to imagine today. And when he returned, the issue of conscription just exploded. By this time, August 1916, the AIF had suffered 23,000 casualties in 42 days at Pozier in the Somme. And Britain and New Zealand had both introduced conscription earlier in the year, and Hughes thought Australia had no choice but to follow suit. Now, his options politically were limited. He could try and introduce the necessary legislation, and Munro Ferguson, the Governor-General, had said he would dissolve the representatives if it failed to pass the legislation. But everybody told Hughes, accurately, that it would split the Labor Party caucus if he tried to pass an act. He thought about issuing a regulation under the famous War Precautions Act, but this would have required the concurrence of the Executive Council, which had much the same membership as his Cabinet. And the Senate probably would have disallowed it. And anyway, the Chief Justice Sir Samuel Griffith advised Hughes that this would be unconstitutional. So he took the step of putting the vote to the people, hoping essentially to get a popular mandate that would then force the hand of his, his colleagues. I can't tell you the full story of the conscription referenda of October 1916 and the one that followed in December 1917. But suffice to say, these debates, which were fought out in long parliamentary debates and also in the streets and public venues throughout the nation. The discussions had an emotional intensity and, I would argue, intellectual sophistication, which we scarcely see in political debate, debate today. At issue was not simply whether conscription was needed militarily. There was a huge debate 
about the clash of principles, about the obligations of citizenship, the equality of sacrifice in times of national crisis, and the, the just and appropriate uh, exercise of power by the Australian state. And all of this was fueled by an explosive mix of anxieties about the mass casualties on the front, about the demographic implications of denuding Australia of its best and fittest men, about military compulsion paving the way for industrial conscription, and about soldiers being replaced in the workforce by women or cheap labour that would under undermine wages. Civil libertarians question the morality of the government compelling individuals to kill, and of course many people questioned the heavy-handed use of the War Precautions Act. Here we have Hughes in fine form. I would actually love to see politicians still doing this. Um, in Sydney, campaigning, and this is a cartoon that represents the fear that Hughes would over. Um, Overween, you'd be overweening his use of powers. I'll have you, it's called, as he, and it plays, I think, on the famous Kitchener cartoon. The debate was also, of course, infused with a noxious sectarianism, as Catholics, who then constituted 22% of the Australian population and who were mostly working class and of Irish extraction, were radicalised by issues such as the declining standard of living and the ruthless suppression by the British of the Easter uprising in Dublin. Conscription was eventually narrowly defeated. And given the heavy-handed use and, and, of, and the harassment and censorship by the government of the anti-conscriptionist forces, I think it is a testament to the power of grassroots politics and the left-wing press. One of the great unsung heroes of the war is Henry Boot, the editor of The Australian Worker, whose brilliant scaremongering journalism must have inspired many people to vote no. Well, the impact of the conscription defeat on the political landscape was dramatic and immediate. Even before the vote was taken, Hughes's cabinet had split, particularly over his issue of using his emergency powers to call men up in anticipation of their going overseas, even though he hadn't got a yes vote. And Hughes was expelled from the New South Wales branch of the Labor movement, where his base was. Then in November, just after the vote, the Federal Court was convened and prepared to cast a vote of no confidence in him because the majority of them were against conscription. Hughes, in typical style, stopped the debate, left the room and called on, quote, those who think with me, follow me. And 24 Labor parliamentarians did. Those left behind probably thought they would form government, but they'd misjudged their man. Hughes and his defectors met excitedly in the Senate club room and agreed to create a new political party, the National Labour Party. A new cabinet was stitched together, and late that night, with the support of Munro Ferguson, Hughes formed a new government, anticipating quickly that he'd get the support of the Liberal opposition. And two months later, in early 1917, after a lot of jostling for position, Hughes's new Labour and the Liberals formed a coalition, the Nationalists. Hughes led this coalition to the polls in May 1917, another federal election, and he won, most significantly, a handsome majority on a ticket of win the war. So it is clear that the vote against conscription had not been a vote against the war. And thereafter, the Nationalists and Hughes were very, very effectively able to demonise the ALP as disloyal, a kind of pervasive stigma such as was attached to many um, non-conservative forces in the 1950s when the charge was that they were communist sympathisers. These people were disloyal to the empire. After the May election, the balance of the representatives was 53 nationalists to 22 Labour. It's been completely transformed uh, from October 1914. And the Senate election later that year resulted in the nationalists winning 24 seats and Labour 12. And in essence, Labour, which in 1914 had the potential to dominate Australian po national politics, was pushed to the margins of, of federal politics, though less so at the state level. Um, and that marginalisation federally of Labour continued not just through the war, but really, I would argue, um, till 1941 and perhaps beyond that. Some historians argue that with this transformation of parliament and the political party uh, structures, Australia lost its reforming urge and its capacity for political innovation. 
My colleague Marilyn Lake will be giving a keynote speech at a conference soon called 1914, The Death of a Nation, by which she means not the deaths on the battlefield, but the death of the potential of the nation. This may seem an overstatement, but I think the legislative record for 1917 and 1918, which the library has kindly provided, speaks to a preoccupation with the war. Supply, war loans, preferential employment for returned soldiers, pensions, taxation, these dominate the parliamentary agenda. They also, uh, the agenda also included what must count as one of the most anti-liberal pieces of legislation ever passed by a federal parliament, the Unlawful Associations Act of December 1916 and amended in July 1917. This was aimed at destroying one of Hughes's bête noires, the Industrial Workers of the World, an anarchist organisation, and this act prescribed any organisation that was hostile to the war. That was it, basically. And in 1917, it was amended to make that even being a member of any of these so-called hostile organisations was an offence. It's notable that in these last years of the war, Parliament seems to have played no role in shaping the post-war settlement. By the end of the war, the British government had conceded that the Dominions should, in contrast to 1914, be consulted about imperial foreign policy and that they should have a much more visible role in international diplomacy. And the practice whereby all communications were channeled through the Governor-General to the colonial office in London, which then decided where they should go within the British government, was clearly anachronistic and it was scrapped in favour of the Dominion Prime Ministers being able, for the first time, to communicate directly with the British Prime Minister and then even only on matters of cabinet importance. So also Australia and the other Dominions were given the right to independent representation at the Paris Peace Conference. But diplomacy was a matter handled almost exclusively by Hughes. Much to the irritation of his cabinet colleagues, Hughes had a tendency to refer matters to the cabinet when he was overseas, only when it suited him, and take its advice only when it suited him. So while he was revelling in tackling the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and the President of the United States Woodrow Wilson on matters to do with the armistice and the post-war settlement, it turned out that many of his colleagues in Parliament and in Australia were actually embarrassed and uneasy about the way in which it seemed he was straining the very imperial relationship that Australia had gone to the war to preserve. And I would argue that by 1918, what is the diplomatic convention, the Prime Minister speaks for the nation, or that Hughes spoke for Australia, was, was a fiction. So let me conclude. I think this very helicopterish view of the war suggests that the role of Parliament progressively became less significant, at least so far as the conduct of the war was concerned. I should say that Parliament never had any say over the operational deployment of Australian troops. I would ask you, I'm not sure it does today. Nor, it should be said, did the Australian Cabinet have any control over the deployment of Australian troops in World War I. This was left in the hands of British authorities. So major battles such as Gallipoli, the Somme, the Third Ypres and even Amiens in 1918 were launched without Hughes's prior knowledge. It was not until mid-1918, after the disaster of the German breakthrough in March 1918, that the Dominion leaders and Hughes challenged British authorities about their use of the AIF. Meanwhile, the responsibility, as I've said, for the critical relationship with London lay not with Parliament but with Hughes. And the Parliament, having acquiesced in the heat of the crisis in the early days of the war, had to watch as the War Precautions Act gave the executive branch of government increased power to the point that many, as I've said, saw almost authoritarian. More widely, the shattering and reconfiguration of the political party system as a result of the conscription debates ended in a significant shift to the right in federal politics that would last for a generation. And I would argue that post-war Australia, not just at the parliamentary level but elsewhere, was a society that was so polarised and dominated by the trauma of the war and by, that there was a kind of conservatism and, and a kind of um, regression almost. Try as I might when I wrote Broken Nation, I couldn't find anything positive to say about the impact of World War I upon Australian politics or society. Nor could I dispel the impression that the war left Australians very inward-looking, almost xenophobic, 
and deeply embittered by grief and the political rancour of the war. However, if the current commemorative plans for 2015 are any indication, it seems unlikely that this is the legacy of the war that we will remember nationally. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Uh, Professor Beaumont, the um, secret uh, agreement which I've read about from uh, Senator Pearce in uh, June, I think it was, uh, 11, where he offered to set up a, an Australian expeditionary force. Uh, I, I've read that that was a uh, deliberately wouldn't have happened without that, prefer that secret preparation which was kept from the Australian public if that hadn't uh, proceeded. Did you have a, a view on that? Look, I don't really know what were the practical effects of that and, and whether it was actually fully implemented. You probably know that there was a major problem with the compulsory military service scheme introduced in 1911. That there were huge levels of non-compliance. I mean, Australian men simply didn't want to do it. Um, so how ready the militia was to convert into an expeditionary force, I'm not frankly certain. Um, I would have to say that the speed with which the AIF was prepared was quite remarkable. Um, you know, the first convoy is ready to go um, in October. The reason it doesn't leave until early November is because of the fear of, of German um, attack, you know, until they've um, got Jap um, a convoy, including, interestingly, a Japanese ship. Um, they're not willing to send the convoy. So, yes, th there must have been, there's certainly a system that enabled uh, the militia to rapidly be raised and converted into the expeditionary force. I, I, I realise that the Commonwealth Gaming uh, Government Closing Factory was established, the, yes, the indeed. salary works in Melbourne, the uh, Royal Military College was set up, you know, all in that sort of... Indeed, and there's a small arms factory at, arms at Lithgow factory. and there's a plant at Maribyrnong in Melbourne. Um, Yes, I mean, I was speaking to the parliamentary librarians a week, last week and they were saying, you know, that if you look at the legislative activity between 1901 and 1914, there's a huge emphasis on defence. I mean, it was one of the key issues that, of course, had not only inspired Federation but which dominated their, their minds uh, in that first decade. But it was defence for, for um, local, of, of the mainland. Oh, they were terrified of the Japanese, yes, yes. There's a lot of invasion scare books around at this time. Any other questions? <coughs> Just one from me, if I might. Mm. Uh, was there, you mentioned briefly the uh, Maribyrnong and Lithgow factories. Uh, was there any development towards Australian shipbuilding, uh, either for built, creating a merchant marine, because I gather shipping was very scarce, yes. And uh, secondly, for uh, military shipbuilding to uh, for escorts or warships. I think the, the the capital ships we've got the sea power centre here. They're all built in Britain, aren't they? Yes. Mm. And um, of course, one of the things that Hughes did during the war, because of his frustrations with the shortage of shipping, merchant shipping, was to establish the Commonwealth Shipping Line, um, which was <laughs> a tour de force really on Hughes's part. He was he was managing to extract from the British while he was in London during 19, uh, 1916. Really quite favourable deals about the sale of raw materials, but the problem was they couldn't be transported from Australia to Britain, not only because of the, um, there had been the U-boat threat, which would then come back, but of course the shipping lines of communication from Canada and so on were shorter. And uh, when the Admiralty was not guaranteeing that there would be um, merchant vessels allocated to the Australian line, he went out and bought, how many was it, old ships and turned them into the Commonwealth shipping line. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and sort of Parliament said, oh, well, so we've got a shipping line. And, um, and some of the Labour people said, oh, or some of the Conservatives said, oh, this is a form of socialism. But uh, um, yes, ship, Australia was not well prepared in that sense because it was so, so integrated into the British imperial system of trade and imperial defence. Yeah. Can I just ask, you referred to the debate around conscription as being emotionally intense and intellectually sophisticated. 
Was there any particular focus on a feminist voice oh, through yes. that debate? Yes, thank you for raising that. Um, the role of women has been much studied uh, because both, both sides of the debate developed arguments that they thought would specifically appeal to women. And um, I wonder if I've left this on my slides. Oh, by the way, this is, um, thank you for that. This is the, the coalition, if I may just uh, digress a moment. This is, um, this is the nationalists being formed. Here's Hughes and here's Cook. Here's your bloated plutocrat capitalism. This is Labour looking fu furious. And this rather plump, I think it's a cat, is called the Tory press. And if anyone can tell me why the cat is a, why the pre Tory press is, is presented that way, I'd love to know. And this is the, again, Hughes as the rat, which the Labour Party is confident will be um, destroyed by the federal election of 1917. But my final one. Now, this is a very good example of the kind of cartoons that came out. Mother, how did you vote in the great referendum? The widow, I relied on Mr Hughes's promise that married men would not be needed and I voted yes. This is one of the lines of, of the no case. Hughes says he'll only take single men, but don't believe him. He will soon take married men. So there were lots of arguments that played on women's supposed biological role. So um, the yes case would argue that women women's role biologically was to produce the warrior, you know, the kind of sparta of women type of argument. On the other hand, those against conscription would say, you mustn't produce babies, men, sons to be destroyed. You know, your role as a mother is the protection of your children, not the destruction. And we should remember that over 80% of the AIF were unmarried. So it's largely sons we're talking about. So there was a real appeal to the mother's vote. Um, and so both sides played on this role of women in producing the men for Australia. It appears, and unfortunately we've, we have not enough evidence of, of the local votes to know exactly how each group voted. Everyone would love to know, but it, we never will. But it does appear that uh, women, a majority of women voted yes. Women, of course, were swept up in large numbers, particularly middle-class women, in this huge patriotic funds movement. They were busy knitting, knitting socks and collecting masses of money and so on. And those women seem to have voted yes. And indeed, those women became part of the emotional hysteria. I think one of my least favourite, most dreadful stories from World War I is this little league of women who formed a, a, a group with the intense, um, the specific purpose of harassing a particular man. So if you were the milkman, um, and remember this was a time when things were delivered to the home, if you were the milkman or the baker, every time you came to a particular home, the woman would say, have you volunteered yet? And they would wear these men down. And then when they finally, it's a bit like an evangelical movement, when they'd finally got their volunteer, great was the rejoicing amongst the movement. So there, were, you know, there was a lot of um, feminine activity, though even in the patriotic funds and in the anti-conscriptionist movement, the women tended to play the backroom role and let the men lead the movement. But I would argue they gained a lot of um, skills in political activism as a consequence, and you might see that coming through in things like the CWA and other political movements by women in the 1920s. Sorry, that was a bit of a rambling answer, but the answer women did play a big role in the war. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're out of time, so um, uh, I'd ask you to join me.